Okay, so before we get underway, just wanted to share a couple of um, housekeeping um, details with you of different ways that you can control Zoom and participate in the webinar tonight. Um, Omar has a really engaging, interactive webinar planned, and so there's, you know, just wanted to bring to your attention some of the tools in Zoom that will help you be a part of that experience. So, you know, just different controls and how to work them on the bottom toolbar. Next slide. There's also different ways that you can react, um, whether it's using the thumbs up or the clapping or raising your hand and um, or asking a question in the chat. Next slide. And then finally, there are um, different ways that you can arrange your view in Zoom so that you see the webinar um, participants or um, just the, the screen in different settings. So just wanted to share that with you all and let's get going. Next slide. Want to welcome everybody tonight. Um, as I mentioned, Omar Shepard has a fantastic webinar that he's worked really hard in planning. And we are thrilled to have Omar as a CS for All Teachers Ambassador. And um, we're just really glad that you've come to join us this Thursday evening. Um, just a little bit about Omar Shepard. He's a curriculum specialist in STEM and career education with the Orange County, California Department of Education. A primary focus of his work is increasing equity and access for all students to engage in CS. Um, Omar serves as an ambassador as well for Girls Who Code. He's a facilitator for um, advanced placement computer science principles for code.org. He's president of the Orange County chapter of computer using educators, as well as a regional partner with the Robotics Education and Competition Foundation. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Omar. Oh, wow. Wow. I'm so excited. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Omar Shepard, uh, as Victoria shared, and it is a humble honor to serve as a CS for All Teachers Ambassador. After all, CS is for all, right? And I really have been wondering about how I might share my journey, because I don't know about you, but I really didn't start off in the CS space. You know, having the honor of then working as a project manager with the Orange County Department of Education, I had the opportunity to lead the California Math and Science Partnership Grant. And it was a real interesting opportunity. We had $1.5 million and three years to really answer this question. How can we create project-based learning units in math and science to implement the new Common Core State Standards and Next Generation Science Standards? And along the way, we began to learn about different ideas around computational thinking learn around different ideas around algorithmic thinking and begin to see several through points. And we had the opportunity then to invest in some tools, um, Arduinos, uh, Raspberry Pis, uh, Lego Mindstorm EV3s. And I'll be honest, when we invested in these tools, we didn't think of them as computer science. In fact, we were trying to find ways to help students internalize and have new ways of understanding things like ratios and things like um, physics concepts and looking at ways they can create physical manifestations of their projects. And interestingly, I guess, as you can imagine, we discovered that what we were tinkering with, what we were encountering was indeed entering the computer science space. I began to wonder about it. And as you can imagine, the grant eventually came to an end. While we did have three years, 70 teachers and hundreds and hundreds of students that we were able to support through the grant, I found myself curious about how I might be able to continue to develop in that space. And that's a little bit of why you see so many logos on the page because I became infinitely interested in how can I create more opportunities through my role here at the county, serving 28 school districts, serving more than 500,000 students, to create access to computer science, to create opportunities for them to engage in programming, robotics, competitions. And that's a little bit of how that all began. 
It all began though, when I began to serve as a coach for the STEM ecosystem. Here, we met with leaders from the district, uh, administrators, principals, teachers, and we began to ask ourselves, how can we create an ecosystem within our community that supports all students in engaging their STEM learning? How can before school and after school programs work together to create pathways for students to be able to experience STEM throughout their learning um, experiences? And that really was the, what the STEM ecosystem was all about. And from there, realizing what a rich opportunity it was, I had an interesting opportunity. You know, there's an organization out there, I don't know if it's one where you live, but it's called Q, Computer Using Educators. Now it's not all about computers, it's about leveraging the best practices of technology to support you in lightening the load as an educator, to be more efficient, to be able to leverage different assessment tools and resources. And I have the honor of beginning to work with them and eventually, interestingly, began to be the president. And that's when I had an opportunity doing a Q conference to be introduced to code.org. Now code.org, many of you may be familiar with, has a myriad of coding um, opportunities for you to engage students. They have full on curriculum if you wanna use it, whether you're in elementary, middle or high school to engage your learners. And I said, you know what? I wanna be someone that can be a resource to my community. I wanna be a facilitator for code.org. So I began to learn about their platform, began to learn about teaching with their curriculum. And I'm gonna tell you, it is a great platform, but it also helped me discover my passion for CS, which led me to the journey of becoming a member of my local CSTA chapter. And if you aren't a member of CSTA, I'm gonna encourage you, a little plug to CSTA, uh, to join your local chapter. It's a great way to be a part of a community of educators, just like we're here at CS for All Teachers, to share resources and share ideas. And, you know, I got to be honest, as I'm out in the space and I'm in these classes, okay, this is what happened. We're doing robotics. I began to engage learners. And I'm looking around, what do I see? I see all boys. Where are the girls? I said to myself, you know what, Omar, you can do something about this. You can be a guy who advocates for the girls. And I became an ambassador for Girls Who Code, talking about free resources, free curriculum, free after school program, whatever you need to support you in building a space where you can have safety and girls learning about programming and coding. But you know what? With so many resources, so many tools, I decided to not stop learning. I dove into the Raspberry Pi certified educator training. And I'm not trying to just um, let you know that the Raspberry Pi is a thing. It is an amazing tool that you can really engage your learners in. And most recently, uh, interestingly how I'm ending in this clockwise manner, um, we began to serve as an event partner for the Robotics Education and Competition Foundation to provide access for hundreds and hundreds of students to compete in robotics. If you're looking for a way to be able to engage your learners in, and especially in this remote way, uh, there's some great opportunities to do that. I invite you to check out their website. But, just a great opportunity for us to learn and grow and share together. I'm looking forward to learning more as well. Let's take a look at our goals for today. We want to explore strategies to engage diverse learners in computer science. We want to engage in a Freire style cultural affinity mapping activity to support building a more inclusive classroom environment. Now I wanna share, given we're in this environment, um, and we are uh, uh, in this webinar style exchange, um, we'll model that activity. And hopefully you'll be open to coming off mic when prompted to share uh, when uh, you see the prompt. We'll go ahead and proceed. All right. Okay, so we wanted to start with a poll and poll the audience and find out where you are, where you, um, are your interest in you know pre-k through 12 cs education is and so um our poll is about what grade levels do you work with um are you working and i know that we have a couple of folks who are work for um edc what grade levels are you working to um support so is it k through 12 is it three through five th uh, third through fifth, sixth through eighth grade, or ninth through twelfth. Um, we just kind of want to get a baseline of where people are at and um, where your interests are in, in you know, pre-K through 12 
CS education. So, so far, uh, we'll keep the poll open for just another minute or so, um, but so far it looks like um, high school computer science if you, is, is um, winning out. Um, June, you asked what if we're working at multiple grade levels, go ahead and, and um, you know, tick the one that m makes the most sense to you. I'm not sure that if you're able to select more than one, but if there's sort of a general like middle school or um, high school or so, whatever makes the most sense to you, select that one. So we've got two people at, at the high school level and one at um, middle school. So we'll just leave mm -hmm. this up for another minute. And for some reason, if you don't see the poll, be, feel free to type your response in the chat as well. I'm sorry, Omar. Oh, no, no, I apologize. Okay, June can't select more than one, but working on multiple projects in high school. So, okay. Oh, and, wow, wow. Yeah, interesting. Hey, I, I can really appreciate that, June. You know, my role is a curriculum specialist working uh, in STEM where my focus is computer science and robotics. And in the career education side, I work with students ages 16 to 21 that either have an IEP or a 504 plan. And my role is to serve them as their career coach and support them with their transition to life after high school. So we're spending our day helping them discover their career pathways and to discuss how to be successful in life. All right. Okay, so I'm going to um, show the results of the poll. Oh, thank you. Oh, wow. So? Okay. Well, hey, I definitely think given we're talking about, can we say a secondary population outside of a few schools I know June's working with in elementary school, that what we're gonna be talking about today is really, really appropriate because it gives us a way to think about how we can take our learners as they're uh, growing in, uh, through these different phases, uh, middle school, high school, and support them in uh, accessing their true intellective capacity. We're gonna talk more about that. All right, so I do have a video and you know, here's the thing. We're gonna try this. I'm going to go ahead and go off camera and I'm going to uh, mute my mic. Well, not yet. <laughs> and I'm gonna open up the video and we will play uh, just uh, a moment of it, and we'll uh, be right back. Just a moment. Here goes the video. For a long time, we've shown students how to use different technologies. We haven't shown them what goes on behind the scenes, the problem solving, the critical thinking, the programming even. And right now in our nation, there is no clear definition of what is computer science, let alone what K-12 computer science is. The K-12 computer science framework is set up to answer that question. The computer science framework, it identifies concepts and practices. You have a concept where it's something that a kid should know or understand, and then you have to practice what, what their action is going to be around that. You put them together, um, and they, they can help us create some really outstanding experiences for kids with computing. Students learn best when the concepts or the knowledge that we hope they acquire is accompanied by hands-on activity, group work, collaboration with their peers, and communication with each other. So this isn't just about teaching coding language. This is really about critical thinking skills. All right, all right. It's about critical thinking skills, which is an interesting thing uh, to stop the video at. I want to make sure we're able to engage, and I know that sometimes bandwidth can be an issue, so I wanted to hop back in. Um, so let's go ahead and, and, and continue chatting about this. And interesting is this extract from the California K-12 computer science standards. And I, I'm curious, um, before I go further in this, um, uh, Heidi June Blythe, uh, because I, I know you aren't in California. I know Stacy um, um, already has them here in California. Are there already adopted uh, K-12 computer science standards where you are? You can feel free to take yourself off mic or just type in the chat. Yes, oh. in Massachusetts. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now, interesting is, um, even though we do have California K-12 computer science standards, they are actually based on the national framework. So a lot of uh, the same ideas as it relates to ways in which you can organize the 
uh, bandwidth of the grades and or the trajectory of learning, the specific core concepts are all really pulled from the same place. And this is an interesting quote that's used in the California version. Computer science is the study of computers and all the phenomena that arise around them by Herbert Simon. All right, let's go ahead and dive in here. So one of the things I often find interesting, and please feel free to type in the chat or unmute yourself, is I'm curious, what are some struggles that you see in your CS classroom? Well, definitely now with the re mostly remote teaching, it's difficult to see um, what students are doing and to be able to answer their questions. Wow, wow. So I no, hear I, from the teachers. Wow, no, I, I, I definitely understand that. And I've um, done a, a lot of work with different platforms to try to figure out what is the best way to, to navigate that space. And I definitely know one of the interesting things we've navigated to has really been looking at how we structure the lesson and how we designate what the outcome of the lesson is. So in some cases, we're really focused on pseudocode. I want you to tell me your thinking. I want you to demonstrate to me how you're going to organize these blocks or this text and what is the desired outcome. Now, one of the struggles I often had was when I was in the classroom, was this idea around pair programming and how I often found really it did not work. It's a dream if it could work, but there were often times that you would have students that maybe um, just weren't the best at collaborating or students that would um, not necessarily take their responsibilities and the project would end up being done by just a singular individual. And I know sometimes that could be a challenge that I've experienced that I've had to work around. Any others, any other struggles anyone experienced in their CS classroom? We've talked about the challenges with remote. Let's look in the chat here. Um, student engagement, especially in remote learning. Wow, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, finding ways to keep and get students engaged um, can be a challenge. And I definitely know one of the things I've done recently has been leaning into the power of the breakout room, uh, getting my students up in groups together, a series of different activities in which they're in breakout rooms, working on shared documents that I can pop into and be able to support that. But to be honest with you, beyond that time that we're together, um, how do you really um, support them and, 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 and utilizing the opportunity as a learning? I often tell my students, look, don't look at this as homework, look at this as future work. This is work that's really going to support you in being prepared for your future. I know that's a, a dream pie, pie in the eye mindset, but I like to think that what we're doing is really helping our kids prepare for the future. Uh, getting students to take CS courses don't necessarily see themselves in. Absolutely. That's part of one of the reasons this is a mission of mine, because I honestly um, had no idea about CS in this way when I was growing up. I did want to be a neurologist. I'll admit that was my goal. I thought I wanted to be a brain surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> but I do acknowledge um, CS is pretty awesome. And I think I would have really gravitated to this space had I discovered it earlier in my career. All right, let's go ahead and go on here, uh, Victoria. So we have another poll for you. Um, this poll is about student, students exhibiting CS anxiety in the classroom. So what, what do you think of, take a minute to think about um, the, anxiety that you're hearing that you um, are, are seeing firsthand. Um, let me see. Give me just a second to pull up the poll. Um, and or, you know, that you've experienced in, in you know, your own family or, or, or network. So is it minimal? Is it is it high? You know, where where are you in that space of um, seeing your students mm -hmm. exhibit CS anxiety? And, and while you're answering that, I do want to comment on Heidi's comment because I I want to honor that. Right? Teachers worry about what happens in the breakout rooms when they cannot be in all of them. Well, we'll pause. I do know that you can record the breakout rooms and do some of those things. But part of what we're talking about right here. Um, later on in our session is going to be thinking about how do we have those structures where there may be norms, where there may be ways in which we engage our learners to maybe circumvent some of that. And as far as the idea around the um, those that are, are, are struggling, 
I think one of the things I loved about CS when I was introduced to it was the ways in which it supports you in developing ways of thinking. So if we can not saying that we want to shift away from true coding product as our outcome, rather I'd argue one of the true value would be finding ways we can hover around the learning and the development and new ways of thinking as we look at ways uh, to identify what our students going to take away from what they're experiencing here. All right, so thank you so much for those that have participated in the poll. Okay, and let me go ahead and share the results. All right, so we see about 21 to 40 percent, which I definitely think is 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 um is definitely an interesting. And some students may not um, haven't had the opportunity to engage yet in that way. So let me go ahead and just take a pause here and and share with you what we're going to be doing today. So often you hear about different books, different uh, mindsets, different shifts in education, right? And, and, and they kind of make their way around, right? So admittedly, I had been introduced to the notion of culturally responsive teaching. Um, uh, uh, and, 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 and the ideas around creating ways to recognize the differences in culture when engaging learners. Um, but it wasn't until I attended a session uh, with Ed Campos at a Q conference, shout out to the Q conference, um, where, I was where I discovered this text by Zaretta Hammond, Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain. Now, this text here is a little bit different because it does a little bit to try and um, um, make a case for learning based upon how the brain works. Now, she used some concepts in the book that I can't specifically rearticulate, right? Their ideas around the ways in which our lizard brain works and the ways in which we as human naturally respond in spaces, right? And I encourage you to get the book. You can get it on Audible or Amazon. Uh, but what I'm sharing is, is that these ideas around how we learn as humans is really grounded in how we are enculturated and how we interact with the world. And one of the most interesting ideas that I was really challenged by was in the book where she talks about teachers sometimes unknowingly falling into what was referred to as a pedagogy of poverty. I said, what? My neck snapped back, right? A pedagogy of poverty? Well, what in the book this was referring to was this idea that sometimes when students are given content that they are facing challenge with, right? Um, we can sometimes acknowledge where they are and go ahead and water down the information or spoon feed them the answers rather than creating either structures or providing support or looking at ways we can scaffold to support them and really being able to access the content. And then I began to feel challenged by this. Like, what do you mean this pedagogy of poverty, right? And, and I had to be honest, how many times had I heard these ideas about UDL? Or how many times has I heard these ideas about creating these, the, these ways of designing your lessons that are ready for all learners? Is that really what she was talking about? Well, a little bit. Really, it was about acknowledging that if we want to consider how we as um, humans learn, if we want to consider the ways in which our brains will allow us to be open to processing information, we have to make a shift. We have to shift to think of ways we can support our students in accessing their true intellective capacity. And she discussed that this was done by helping students build a sense of community. So what we're gonna do right now, I'm gonna give ourselves five minutes. Uh, Victoria, if you can please drop the link in the chat. There's a framework that was developed by uh, uh, this book, um, the Ready for Rigor Framework that is broken up into a series of quadrants that you can use when thinking of lessons, when planning and, and looking at how you're gonna engage your learners, whether it's in the beginning of the year or as you're going along the way, right? Looking at the levels of awareness, looking at learning partnerships, right? Looking at information processing and community of learners in the learning environment. We're gonna, we're gonna take a look at this, but I'm gonna go ahead and set a timer here and I'd like for you to take, oh, five minutes or so, as we've said, for you to observe the document and to begin to um, review the quadrants. And then we'll come back after the five minutes 
for you to be able to um, join us in a debrief and a discussion around the Ready for Rigor framework. Omar, I apologize. I huh? don't have the link. Okay, so it's no problem at all. <laughs> I would be more than happy to drop it. I just dropped the link in the chat. It's in the chat. Okay, thank and, you. Um, yeah, everyone has <laughs> I have it at uh, my okay. fingertips. But <laughs> Well, fortunately, we, we've just dropped it in. And okay. I'm curious to hear, um, and I'll, maybe I'll reset the timer to give us five minutes to actually read and, and process. And um, it is up on the screen. Maybe I'll open it up in case uh, someone needs to see it in case they're just looking at the screen and they aren't able to um, click on the link. Wait, maybe two more minutes. toggle back to the presentation. Interestingly, of course, I think I messed up my timer, but we'll engage just one more minute. All right, all right. So hopefully everyone had a chance to at least get a cursory gander and, 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 a, and a look at the Ready for Rigor framework. I'm curious, uh, either by a show of hands or type in the chat, um, have you had an opportunity to uh, review the Ready for Rigor framework uh, previously? No, okay. Well, hopefully we're gonna, oh wow, no, June, okay. Well, hopefully we're gonna have a chance to uh, uh, discuss it some more and help uh, explore how it may be a helpful tool to support us in building community in our classroom. So the first layer of the Ready for Rigor framework was awareness. And awareness really spoke to knowing your own cultural lens, understanding the three levels of culture, recognizing cultural archetypes of individualism and collectivism, Understand how the brain learns. Acknowledge the socio-political context around race and language. That's a deep one right there. Recognize your brain's triggers around race and culture. Really, I think that's really about self-awareness, really, right? Broaden your interpretation of culturally and linguistically diverse students' learning behaviors. Now that's a lot to unpack there just in the one quadrant of awareness. And, and often when we review this, there's lots of questions come up. 
I'm curious, as we look at this here, feel free to take yourself off of chat. How do you think this type of um, um, lens, the lens of awareness, right? Uh, as discussed here on this slide, how might you think incorporating this impact uh, building community in your classroom? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to be taking a quick gander here, diving in further on this concept around the three levels of culture, exploring the three levels of culture, surface, shallow, and deep. So as we look at this image here, it really gives us lots of clues into the three levels of culture. And I'm really going to encourage you to kind of take a glean at what's within them, right? On the surface level, what do we see? We see talk style, music, attire, holidays, cooking, language, literature, dance, games, right? I mean, in many ways, this is how many of us define ourselves, right? What music we're listening to? Are you listening to rock and roll or are you listening to hip hop? Are you listening to NPR or classical music, right? Do you play board games or video games? Lots of ways to consider that. Then there's the shallow, right? Personal space. Thinking of that, have you ever been in a conversation with someone that maybe had a different sense of the shallow level of culture and maybe got a little bit too close when they were talking to you, right? Respect, eye contact, tempo of work. Eye contact is interesting. When you think about this from a perspective of different cultures, different nations, and how different folks interact, some of these areas here, I think really aren't so shallow, is it, right? When someone chooses to or not to dress or look at someone in the eye, that really could be representative of something different, right? I was watching a movie one time and there was someone from India and when they saw their grandfather, they went down and like rubbed their feet. I thought, gee, what's happening here? And in their culture, that's a sign of respect, which I think is an interesting as we begin to think about how our students may represent many cultures. And they may have many different ways of talking, lots of different types of music. And I have seen this as I was growing up, right? Uh, we'll bring in our potluck. But I think this is a lot deeper than that, right? This is about looking at these representations of culture and thinking about how they impact how we structure and build community in our classroom, right? The next level is deep. Let's go deep here. This is really about concept of self definition of family, the notions of awareness, decision-making, concepts of a higher power, spirituality, individualism versus collectivism, right? And I think these are different ways that we have to acknowledge that as our students come into our classroom, they identify with different levels or in different ways with these different levels of culture, right? It is it's something we have to think about as we're engaging them. The surface level really has a low emotional charge so that changes don't create great anxiety in a person or group. This level is made up of observable and concrete elements of culture, such as food, dress, music, and holidays. What would you say is your surface level of culture when you think about that, right? How does this demonstrate in your life what the service element is because admittedly while we're talking about building community in our classrooms we are a part of that community so we must have a thought around how that is represented by ourselves as well all right this level that's shallow again in my opinion i don't know why they refer to it as shallow let's look at this one here this level is made up of unspoken rules around everyday social interactions and norms such as courtesy attitudes towards elders, nature of friendship, concepts of time, personal space between people and nonverbal communication, a little bit what we were talking about a moment ago. But it's at this level of culture that we put into action our deepest cultural values, right? Nonverbal communication that builds rapport and trust between people. How do you think you'd be able to build a trusting relationship with someone that may have a different cultural manifestation than you have. It's something to think about, right? That's really what we're talking about. We're talking about building community in our classrooms, right? 
And it goes on to say that while this has a low emotional charge, at this level, we interpret certain behaviors as disrespectful, offensive, or hostile. This is where signals can get crossed, right? If we haven't done a good job of setting up structures to build community in our classroom, we could have students that may have their signals crossed. And this can create senses that, hey, this person is disrespecting me. <laughs> and it may not be that that's the case at all, right? All right. So this deep level though, level three, is made up of tacit knowledge and unconscious assumptions that govern our worldview. This may come from things we've learned in our family, books that we've read, beliefs that we hold deeply, right? And it also contains, whether good or bad, how we look at things ethically and spiritually, and, and as well as ideas around theories of group harmony. So I really want us to understand these ideas around these three levels of culture are really deep, and they greatly impact our levels of awareness in our classroom because they really will be what will help us identify ways we can support all students in being able to feel a sense of interconnectedness, right? So the rest of the Ready for Rigor framework really does go into, as we shared, um, um, information processing, as well as learning partnerships and community of learners and learning environment. Okay, I'm gonna take a pause here and look in the chat to see if there are any, any questions here. Yeah, um, yeah, everything is a challenge to these days with virtual learning. And I definitely think um, there's, there's definitely a lot of uh, considerations we have to have now. Um, and I definitely experienced that when I got Zoom bomb once. It really blew my mind that I had to um, experience that. But oh yeah, I'm sorry, yes, Heidi. Please share. Hi. Um, so I have a question about this rigor frame, ready for rigor framework, and they talk about community of learners and learning environment. I don't see that it involves the whole school or the administration or the counselors or the mm -hmm. nurses, which I think together would be m more support for the teacher who's trying to put these into place in the classroom as well. I really appreciate you you sharing that. And I definitely know that you must have a cohesive team that involves administration leadership as well as teacher leadership to be able to facilitate this. And I want you to know this Ready for Rigor framework is just a single document that I extracted to talk about the activity we're gonna do in a moment. Um, but I want you to know in the book, um, she definitely does speak to that. She does speak to how to shift um, some of these ideas and look to how it is more than just you as the individual in the classroom with your students. So um, I definitely do want to acknowledge that. All right, let's take a look here. Um, so here we want to think about this idea around information processing. So this is where I really began to have those ideas that pushed back against these notions around the pedagogy of poverty, right? because you do wanna provide challenge in order to stimulate brain growth and increase intellective capacity, right? That's all about the rigor, right? That's how students are grappling with new content. This idea, this is completely random, but <laughs> this idea that maybe you might be engaging with these Raspberry Pi kits here, doing some kind of project. And maybe in the beginning, you're just having some awareness about working with your breadboard, but in the end, you've now created a full on project that you've developed because you have new meaning about this, right? Um, but it also connects new content to culturally relevant examples and metaphors from students, community, and everyday lives. Now, this is huge because it's not just about having a representation from a book that is someone that's the culture of the person in the classroom, right? This really goes deep. This goes to thinking about, well, gee, how can student voice impact how we develop and design lessons? How can student interests be the center point of what we're developing that allows us to create something that is personally meaningful to them. And I think that's a huge part when it comes to the components around this culturally responsive pedagogy, because it is really looking at the fact that we're teaching content, but we're looking at ways to make the content accessible to our students by making it relevant to them by bringing it into their world with the things that they're engaging in or already thinking about or things that would somehow make their community better. Um, going on here, it says, uh, provide students authentic opportunities to process content, teach students cognitive routines to use the brain's natural learning systems and use formative assessments and feedback to increase intellective capacity. 
All right, here, we're gonna go ahead and, and power through this. Learning partnerships, reimagine the student and teacher relationship as a partnership, right? Um, I've been practicing that. It's, 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 it's a shift, you know, um, because you're allowing the student now to join you in the driver's seat of their learning. But when students have that personal engagement and connection to it, it definitely helps them to be able to feel like they're doing something that doesn't feel like homework or work. You know, I often talk about this with my students, 16 to 21, right? Have you thought about the types of things that you really enjoy doing and identified any transferable skills that can allow you to do that and not feel like you're working? Completely unrelated, but comparable when we think about these ideas of, you know, mindset. All right. We want to take responsibility to reduce students' social emotional stress from stereotype threat and microaggressions. A little bit of that can be helped when we support students in really feeling that interconnectedness in the beginning of the classroom. But if we're honest, I find when I'm middle school, high school, these students, while they may have been together for many years, may not have even spoke or know each other in any way. So it's really um, um, important to acknowledge that, right? We wanna help students um, cultivate a positive mindset and build a sense of self-efficacy and balancing giving students both care and push, right? So that's a real interesting to me. And when we think about this, um, I wonder, so when your students are demonstrating that they're struggling a little bit, that they're having a difficult time figuring out the code, if that's the challenge that we're working on, what might be some strategies that you're currently using to help your students as they're trying to discover how to come to solution? Does anyone um, feel comfortable sharing or maybe typing in the chat? Well, I could definitely share some experiences I've had uh, recently uh, looking at some um, um, cipher text activities that have been developed to really essentially you're taking the character of A to Z and you're shifting right um, by one, two, three, five, and you're coming up with a series of letters that the students need to decipher to get the message. It could be something as simple as good morning and it'll look so complex, right? I do recall when students were really challenged with this um, and I felt that it was supposed to be so easy. I thought to myself, well, gee, what can I do to support these students without actually, you know, <laughs> giving them the answer? And I think that's an interesting because there's lots of opportunities here for us to leverage resources, but how do we do that? Oh, I see a comment here. I like the idea of care and push is connected to productive struggle, scaffolding through the challenge without giving too much help and hence, absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. And lastly, we wanna really acknowledge this idea of community of learners and the learning environment by creating an environment that is intellectually and socially safe for learning, making space for student voice and agency and building classroom culture and learning around communal talk and, and sociocultural tasks and structures, right? And using classroom rituals and routines to support a culture of learning. You know, this is when I really discovered the value of using music cues in your classroom. Let me ask you, have any of you ever used music cues in your classroom to transition with your students? Well, this is something that I learned in a Q conference. I know I keep plugging them, but I'm a president and I kind of just do that naturally and I'm so sorry. But he here's what happens though. Oh, it happens in meetings though, awesome. Well, here's what happened. Um, we were beginning to think about, well, gee, we need to be able to figure out a way to save our voices as teachers. Have you ever at the end of the day had your voice just exhausted? Well, these ideas of using music cues can help you be able to shift the room without saying a thing at all, right? So as an example, I am no singer, but I'm gonna practice because I don't wanna mess up my bandwidth by trying to find it on YouTube. Let's say you're all working on activities and you want to bring the group back. There's a song that goes, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. You play the song and the students all come back together and save your voice. Okay, students, thanks so much for coming back. And it's just so natural, right? I've also seen an activity where you have students grouped, right? 
they're at chart papers. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, they're at chart papers. They're um, at, at whiteboards. They're at whiteboards. If you haven't heard it, look it up, right? They're collaborating on something. Maybe you're doing a CS360 where you've got the students all around the room on whiteboards and they're doing some decoding or deciphering or drafting code, right? And as they do that project, you want them to now shift on to the next chart. Well, you can pull up good old Beyonce, right? And play the song to the left, to the left. And the students, as they hear that, will know to shift to the next chart. And this is just something that I'm adding here as we think about culture, acknowledging culture, and thinking about ways we can bring in structures to support us in building these things in our classroom, right? At the beginning, yeah, it's kind of weird. The students are like, what is, what is this teacher doing? But once it becomes part of the norm, right, it's just what you do. And it becomes um, second, you know, um, nature. All right. So I'm curious right now, please do type it in the chat or pop into the um, uh, uh, voice uh, off mute. What are some strategies to plan for equity and build intellectual safety amongst diverse learners in your classroom that you may already try or do? Saying their name. Oh, wow. Oh, my goodness, Heidi. Oh, my goodness. I just got to say that because currently in Orange County, I don't know if you've heard of this, but we are a, a MTSS state, multiple tier systems of support. I'm not going to go into it right now, but it's a framework to support all kids, all learners at all schools. And essentially, one of the mantras is know my name, my face and my story. It's a way of thinking about how you can engage all learners. And I'd be remiss if I didn't bring that up right now. So when you said saying their name correctly, that's so deep to me right now, right? Because I definitely see the value of that. Um, creating a safe space to share work in progress. Absolutely, right? Thank you, June, for sharing. Thank you, Heidi. All right, so what we're gonna do right now is take a look at an activity. This activity really is a great way to build community in the very beginning, right? Get kids that don't know each other to get a little bit of interconnectivity. And this also is great for adults, I gotta be honest. It's almost, can I say, cathartic? Here on this graphic, I model what the activity looks like. Typically, what you do is you would have students either in the classroom, each at their own chart, or in this case, we would actually place students in breakout rooms and they would go to the breakout room and select the slide that's on that breakout room and they would click on the cultural affinity map document. I'm gonna see if I can't grab that document to grab a link to let you see what it looks like. And here on this document, what you do is you're asking students to respond to a series of prompts. So here's what it looks like. In the first segment, students have 10 minutes to respond to a series of prompts that they get to um, um, see on the, on the page. I'm sorry, I went too far ahead. What are you listening to? What are you watching? What ticks you off? And what's up with the fam, right? So I'm curious, you know what? We're, 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 it's a safe space. We're just a few of us here in the room. Maybe I'll pull up the text right here and I'll put this in. And if you're open to sharing, let's model this right now as a way of demonstrating what this is like, right? All right, so I'm gonna go first. I am listening to NPR. That's what I'm listening to. All right, Stacy. Um, if you wouldn't mind typing it in the chat, Heidi and, uh, and June and Victoria and uh, Blythe, feel free, type it in the chat. What are you listening to right now? Or say it off, off mute if, you, if you're comfortable with that. Omar, this is Victoria. I'm listening to jazz. Oh, wow, I jazz. jazz. Oh, WCLK. my goodness. That sounds very <laughs> relaxing for me right now. NPR. Yep. I, I should do plus one for the NPR, but I'll do it twice so it demonstrates the... Um, um, okay, so if that's the case, June, what's your NPR station? I am SCPR KPCC. That is our local public radio station. <laughs> oh, wow, Stacy's listening to dubstep. Ooh. Oh, wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. Sorry, Sorry Omar. My husband has amazing uh, 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 musical taste, and so I listen to what he puts on, and it's phenomenal. You can hear it in the background. <laughs> oh, wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. Satellite radio. 
Okay, okay. So, hey, listen, this is one representation. Let's go ahead and keep it going here. And listen, if I'm honest with you guys, we're all adults. I just want to tell you the original iteration of this says what pisses you off. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. But we're working with learners, students. We changed it to what ticks you off, but I wanted to be <laughs> honest. So when you saw that there, you knew in case you ever see this in another place, <laughs> what it actually says on the original version. All right, so let's let's think about this here. What ticks you off? I'm gonna write coronavirus. <laughs> that ticks me off. Okay, I'm sorry. COVID-19. All right, let me think. What ticks you off? Anyone else in the chat? Um, Autocrats. <laughs> oh, what? Autocrats. Oh, okay. that's awesome. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. COVID idiots, Omar. COVID idiots tick me off. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> COVID idiots. I don't even know if I'm spelling this right. All right. All right. All right. And we'll keep it going here. So, what are you watching? That could be YouTube. That could be Netflix. That could be a show on television. That could be the news. Oh, Omar, I'm watching, Greg and I are watching The Expanse right now, and you and your uh, lovely, uh, wonderful wife would love it. It's about, it's a very progressive show about wow. a couple hundred years from now, science fiction, um, space exploration, and things like that, but how to have like equity, diversity, and wow. equality in wow. the solar system. Oh my wow. goodness, you would like that's, it. On that's Netflix. powerful. Yeah. Hey, did I spell Expanse correctly? I hope I did. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm on my phone. So I'm oh, it's, it's oh, okay. It you have it I'm, perfectly. I, yep, oh, yep, I'm just perfect. I'm just so humbled that you joined. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, anyone else would like to share? If you're comfortable, um, feel free. What are you watching? Uh, and we'll just type it in the in the box here. Uh, America's Got Talent. Oh wow, that's awesome. America's Got Talent. Okay. Um, yes, it's entertaining and inspiring. That's right. Um, okay. <laughs> Oh, my, I'm sorry for laughing, but someone said going lowbrow, Real Housewives. Hey, no one's hating on the Real Housewives. <laughs> That's which, me, <laughs> which city are you watching, um, I watch Victoria? them all, so currently it's Potomac and Orange County. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I, I guess we'll just jump because we're almost at the end of our time, and I'm just yes. trying to demonstrate this. So lastly, what's up with the fam? I want to say um, all the kids home on Zoom. <laughs> And anyone else want to share? Good healthy and healthy. So that's awesome. That's awesome. And we're going to definitely um, send out good vibes that everything stays that way. Hey, we got a new uh, vaccine I hear out from Dr. Fauci. Uh, we'll see about that. Uh, hope that doesn't get political or anything. I'm just talking about the vaccine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, good and healthy. Yeah, Omar, I just got my, sh my, Greg and I got our shingle shots yesterday. Oh, so wow. I feel like I've been, yeah, I'm so happy. Uh, I, I feel like I've been punched in the arm, but I, I love oh, wow. my That's vaccine. awesome. So, so yep. as we approach this portion of the presentation with only two minutes left, just imagine in your classroom, this is the beginning. These kids don't know each other. They haven't really interacted. They don't really know anything about each other. Think about the convergence of culture that's happening right now as we're even modeling this together. I'm wondering, right? What are your thoughts on this, right? Imagine all of your students together and I'm gonna do my Beyonce right now, to the left, to the left. And now the students are reviewing all the other boards. What do the other students, oh, you're watching, hey, I'm watching that too. Oh, wow, is that what's up with your fam, right? Building, em building empathy, building community, building connection in the space, right? I'm gonna, gonna save this, um, but I just wanted to model this uh, activity because I think it's a great way of, um, of demonstrating um, how we can still, even in this virtual space, build community. What if your students were on Zoom, right? And you had them uh, in breakout rooms, they did that. Or what if you, just like I did, took the time to do it that way with your students? Would anyone like to share how they see this, maybe um, integrating it with their students in their classroom? Please feel free to come off a mute or type in the chat. I know we're at the end here, but hopefully you'll be open to sharing. We just got a couple more slides and I'll, I'll let you off the next few moments. Thank you so much. So Omar, June wrote that she envisions this being something you could also use remotely. Oh, wow. Thank you, June. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can use this remotely. And um, um, please do. You can always grab the slide deck and you can um, iterate it as well. Mm -hmm. 
can see this work out when I was in kids. Absolutely, definitely with adults in PD. And I was gonna share, if you don't mind me sharing, that someone commented in a previous reflection survey that they thought that it was somewhat cathartic. All right, so with that being said, are you ready to get started implementing these great strategies with CS in your classroom? Well, let's get started. Well, because we're running out of time, I want you to know that there are loads of resources that we've curated for you on this document here. And I'm gonna see if I can't, well, I think Victoria, is this document being shared already? Should I pop it in the chat right now? Um, we're okay. gonna share it um, as a part of the, um, the recording and as a standalone um, okay. document on the CS for All Teachers website. Awesome, so awesome. It will I be available multiple ways. Awesome, I also just pasted this link in the chat uh, for someone to open up this resource page. What you're gonna find on the resource page, just so you know, you're gonna find a link to this presentation. You're also gonna find a series of CS resources. It's almost like a, what is it? A, a smorgasbord of CS. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I just really get excited about all these things. Okay, Smorgasburg of CS, of course, again, linking to our California K-12 CS standards, but I shared with you, they were developed by the National Framework, so all the things there, you can find a way for it to apply for you in your state. And we've got loads of other content here that you can look to connecting it to. And in case you didn't know this, check out the appendix. It's where you're going to find all the resources for integrating across any content you want to know. If we had time, I'd open it up right now, but trust me, click on the appendix and you're gonna see ways for you to integrate CS K-12 in each of these content areas linked here on this page, okay? And then there's also access to more curricular resources and a link to the Orange County Department of Education computer science website. I'm gonna encourage you to follow me on Twitter. That's at Dr. Stem. I'm laughing because um, I uh, got that in an ed camp one day uh, when I was just trying to learn about ways you can use Twitter to build your professional learning network. And I want you to know it is true. You know, you, you meet people and you can share resources, get new ideas. Also here on the resource link is a page to the Ready for Rigor framework link, which you can access that right away. The three levels of culture graphic, as well as the graphic with the breakdown of the concepts and subconcepts within the California K-12 computer science framework but again, applicable um, broadly. So with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and stop sharing my screen now and go back to the other presentation. I'm sorry, because I was, and here we go. And again, I would like to thank everyone um, for uh, joining us today for this, um, this session, but a few points to consider. As you're thinking about building lessons, as you're thinking about how you're gonna engage your learners, consider this, how would you assess if your students had met the CS standard you're working on? How would you assess if your students had met the content standard you were working on? And what would you expect to witness if this practice were active in a classroom? Remember, as I was sharing earlier, shifting away from prescribed outcomes and moving into these ideas around cognitive and intellectual development, right? And thinking about ways we could support students by creating structures, additional scaffolding, creating that care and push for them to be able to grapple with content to be able to be successful. All right, so I'm wondering, might there be any questions? I'm looking in the chat, feel free to come off mute. Thank you, thank you. All right, so with that being said, I think I'll pass it over to Victoria. Thank you so much, Omar. So just wanted to share a few um, upcoming events and activities for um, that CS for All Teachers is gonna be hosting a, a Twitter chat next Thursday night um, with our another community ambassador, Jen Manley, and we would love for you to join us. Um, you, I put our Twitter handle in the chat. Um, and you follow us and we, we've got a great um, topic of tips and tricks for first year CS teachers. And we're, we're gonna have new teachers and um, longtime teachers sharing out through the Twitter chat. So please 
be sure to join us next Tuesday at eight o'clock Eastern, five Pacific. And then we want you to save the date for an upcoming webinar that we're um, having in early December, that's on December 7th, with another community ambassador, Vanessa Jones, um, going beyond the hour of code. And so that's gonna be really great. Vanessa is planning some breakout sessions within the webinar, so we would love to have you all um, join us for that as well. Next slide. And of course, we encourage you to join CS for All Teachers. Um, whether Whatever your place in education is, pre-K through 12 education, um, CS for All Teachers is a free virtual community of practice with tons of resources, amazing ambassadors like Omar, facilitating discussion groups. It's just, we really do a lot to make sure that there is plenty for everyone who is a member of CS for All Teachers. So we encourage you to sign up. And I, that's pretty much it. I have, I think the final slide is just a, um, uh, our website address and our Twitter handle. And I, I know we are a few minutes over. I just wanna say thank you so much to everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much to Omar for such oh. a wonderful presentation. Uh, just information packed and so, pleasantly presented and really engaging and and inspiring so thank you oh, and thank you yeah, thank you both thank you and, and omar wonderful and the, i think the best takeaway tonight is uh know your student's name and know their story that's right that's yeah. right yeah so with that i'll say good night and goodbye and i hope everyone has a great rest of their evening all right. Thanks, Take everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Can we share Can the resources? Oh, absolutely. please do. Please okay. do share. We'll do. All right. Thank uh, you. Thanks. Yes. And thank all of this you. will be up on the CS for All Teachers website. We'll, and we'll, sh we'll share everything that was shared tonight on CS thank for you. All Teachers. Thank Good you. Good night, June. Good all to right, see bye you. Bye now. Bye. Bye.